my name's is this thing on? Cool. Yeah, so my name's Dan Rivera. I'm a mechanical engineering undergrad from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I care a whole lot about improving the function of wearable devices for people with disabilities. Uh, the method that I'm choosing to do that with is modeling muscle tissue with models that are inspired by molecular level dynamics. The whole point being that if we can model that system well enough, we can give pre-existing actuators like a DC motor biological properties. So, you know, we have to simulate stuff before we can actually build it, and then the question is how good are we at actually doing that? And it turns out that we don't really understand muscle. Uh, the most commonly used model, Hill model, basic idea with this thing is that we have a contractile element, you activate it, it stretches this series spring, and the tension in this spring is your simulated muscle force. But that assumption actually breaks down if you were to try to model something in a dynamic condition, like a medial gastroc, shown here during human cycling in the black line. We have a two contractile element hill in red and a one contractile element hill in gray with an average R squared of 0.54. Those results are pretty typical of a hill model. So that sort of begs the question, what are we missing? Well, in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of work showing uh, how a spring-like element inside muscle that we once thought was passive it's actually a bit more active in that it binds to relatively rigid members inside the muscle during contraction. Take it a step further, we think it winds. Point being that it's a lot more responsible for muscle forces than we previously thought. A muscle model that I derived to explain this behavior, I'll call it the winding filament model, or WFM for short, says that what is stretching this series spring and causing our simulated muscle force is this interaction between the contractile element and a tightened spring operating around a pulley that can rotate and translate in response to each of these forces. So the question I had was would that improve force predictions in OpenSim? We had 259 ex vivo mouse soleus experiments to play with, and the cool thing about OpenSim is that you can actually define an experiment in terms of length. So you can have two muscle models sharing this space occupied by a single muscle, and just control the length input, have some ground right here, do constant stimulation. Here we see just a cyclic length change, plus minus 10% of resting length. And Experimental forces of that simulation in black dotted line, WFM in red, hill model in blue. You can see that that more nuanced description of what's causing muscle contraction allowed the WFM to more realistically reflect forces during cyclic length changes, as it did in the 258 other ex vivo mouse soleus experiments. And you can see that the hill responds pretty sharply to just stimulation alone, seen here 15 hertz constant on the x-axis. So that's that's pretty great if you're a mouse, but I was wondering if we could simulate humans with this thing. And of course, it was taunting me the whole entire time I was trying to figure this out. But all of those experiments allowed us to whittle down this model to just two free parameters. And so it was pretty easy thereafter to write a basic static optimization protocol, same objective function as OpenSim, minimizing activation squared to torque equality. And all of those parameters were actually already supplied with OpenSim, so there was very little work to do after that. In those steps that you saw on the previous slide, for the hip, knee, and ankle, we achieved an R squared of one, which is actually not that relevant or important at all because OpenSim can already do that. But we were able to do so while including muscle properties like the elastic forces in tendon and titan, uh, damping, forces and muscle history, which is important if you wanted to do a predictive simulation with your optimized results, because how the forces developed and got there in the first place is important if you want to change them, such as adding a torque actuator at the knee. So where I sort of want to take this, you know, I don't really feel like it's safe to say that this is a better model. Um, it might be better in single ex vivo mouse soleus experiments. What I think is better is being able to tune this model and then put it in a different condition. And I want to test that using the cycling data that I showed earlier, as well as more rigorous perturbation test using a bi-directional dual track treadmill that we have at NAU. Um, I'm also interested in where this model, or what it has to offer the field of haptics and physical human robot interaction. Um, see in here, I had some fun videos not playing though. 
So my mentors are awesome. Uzma Tahir is awesome for doing all those mouse experiments and sharing them. Cooper Undergraduate Research Award is awesome for making sure I could eat while I was doing this. And you guys are awesome because that was my first five minute talk ever. And thank you for bearing through that. And I hope there's any questions. Let's take some questions. You're an undergraduate student, right, Daniel? Way to go, man. Do we have questions for Daniel? In the back. You want to go long? Whoop. <laughs> Almost. Not long enough. That's why it's padded. In, in your mass validation, do you know what was causing the first um, peak to be so to be higher than in the experimental data? So are you talking about the the cyclic diagram I was showing? Yeah, in each cycle you have two peaks. One peak is erroneously high, or the, the blue. And so why? Do you, what, what do you think was causing that high peak? So in the WFM model, Titan is wrapping around the pulley as well as translating it. Whereas in the Hill model, you only had the basic assumption is that active contraction is the only thing that causes, or the, the primary thing that causes muscle forces. So you get a more nuanced interplay between length changes where you have something that's storing energy and producing force going this way around the pulley, but then length changes that are pulling opposite to that. So in a simple way, the simplest way of explaining it is that you get a mechanism for producing more force. Okay, we have to cut it off there, so thank you, Daniel. Cool. And Anna Braun is going to get set up.